Hi, my name is Vicki Byler. I um, grew up in a, a Christian home. I came to know the Lord at a very young age through a program in our church. A dear woman named Dottie led me to the Lord. And um, as I grew up in that church, was very active in the youth group and the church activities. Um, I knew at a young age that I really loved sport and wanted to use sports um, as my vocation. I left, graduated from high school and went to the King's College, which is a um, Christian liberal arts college to study health and physical education. When I graduated, uh, the only career field at that point was to be a health and physical education teacher, which I did and coached for many years at Christian High School. My first teaching job out of college was actually on the beach in New Jersey and just really loved to connect my heart and passion for sport with you know, teaching in a Christian environment. Um, after about eight or nine years of being in the elementary to high school level, I wanted to reach to be a, a college level coach and athletic director. And so I uh, switched careers at that point, um, began teaching sport ministry at Washington Bible College, which then merged with Lancaster Bible College. Um, so throughout my career, I've been in ministry my whole career path. Um, I was a professor at Lancaster Bible College and uh, chaired the health and physical education department, which housed our sport management program, our health care management program, and our health and physical education program. Uh, a couple years ago, that opportunity uh, to be the chair was... Um, they did some restructuring in our department and so i uh, lost my position there and uh, at that point it was pretty devastating in my life because i felt like i had been in the career that i felt the lord had led me to um, but as we know god's plans are different and um, that opportunity left me um, a, a, a chance to become a part of two support ministry organizations. One is CSRM. So now I serve as the acting um, executive director there. And um, if you asked me three years ago, if I felt like the Lord had those opportunities, I, I wouldn't have seen that. But uh, losing that teaching position led to other opportunities, which I'm really grateful for. I love CSRM. I love working with people all over the world uh, who have a heart and passion for sport and connecting people, not just to teach them more about the sport, but actually to teach them um, how to use that sport in a ministry aspect to bring people to Christ. So that's a little bit about my background. I also spent many, many years in teaching, um, having the health and physical education background, working with families impacted by disability. So one of the courses that I taught was teaching adaptive physical education, came in contact with an organization called Johnny and Friends. Uh, and though that organization does family retreats for families impacted by disability. So I spent 11 years volunteering and then serving a little bit on staff with Johnny and Friends, which led to me wanting to write a book on how to be more inclusive for those families to give them opportunities to be involved in sport and recreation. And so that's a little bit about my background, which led to the writing of the book, From Barriers to Belonging. Hey everybody, welcome back. We are back and today we have a very special guest, excited to have on. I've been working on getting her on for a while. Dr. Linville has been trying to pester her on for a while, and she finally now can't say no. So, today, we are finally getting to Dr. Vicki Byler joining us on Misfits, and we are going to be talking about her new book, uh, From Barriers to Belonging, and we're also going to be talking about a couple of other things related to the title of her book and her story that you just heard as well. So... We're going to jump right in. Dr. Byler, welcome to Misfits. Thank you. It's great to be here. So you have a very long, extensive resume in terms of education, in terms of ministry, in terms of athletics, in terms of dealing with people with disabilities, in terms of dealing with ministries and churches dealing with this topic. 
And so we're going to try to work our way through all of them at some point. But let's start out actually with a different area of this idea of barriers to belonging. Because the title itself is something that should resonate with misfits in general. As far as barriers to belonging and everything else. And something that you had just talked about in your testimony. As far as you had a little bit of an unexpected career change. But that it actually brought about... I don't know if it's something you necessarily were hoping for, but something that you I know you had been wanting to become, be able to do more and getting involved more with the CSRM stuff, reach gathering, overwhelming victory, and, and more of some of the resourcing and networking side of the work you already were doing as a professor. So let's talk a little bit about how, for, for those that are possibly dealing with similar situations right now, in terms of career paths feel like they're being blocked or ending or something's going what how give, give us some words of wisdom here as far as how can we actually go about this in a way that is productive rather than that is detrimental to either our health or our ministries or just life in general um, that's a great, a great question, Andrew, um, because at that point, I really did feel like my whole world was falling apart. It actually happened right before I had uh, knee replacement surgery also. So um, at that point, I had to just focus on, you know, getting healthy, um, having my surgery, getting healthy. But one of the things that I didn't want to do was become angry and bitter. And um, I, I wanted to really uh, be still, which is really hard for me. So I think that surgery piece fell into place. I, I had to be still. I had to wait. A good friend of mine gave me one of those little plaques that says, be still and, and wait. And I had that, you know, as I was recovering, sitting there, you know, just seeing, you know, what is it that the Lord had for me next? I was always involved with CSRM um, as a volunteer, had been on staff a little bit previously, um, but had also gone to uh, several of the reach gatherings and, you know, just was volunteer for them when I would be there. Um, but at that point, I never really saw that there were opportunities, didn't know that those opportunities were out there. But through the, you know, time of connecting with those people um, through, you know, whatever in networks we had at that point and just people hearing my story, um, those opportunities opened, you know, the doors opened and I just kept walking through. Um, I was involved with a, a, a good support group, uh, several others who had lost their jobs. Um, and we had a, just a Christian network support group that met every probably twice a month for a, a couple of months just to how do we walk through that? How do we navigate that well? Um, and you know, just reading some devotionals of, you know, what is my next step? Um, I can't remember the name of the book offhand, but there was just a really good devotional that I that I walked through. Um, you know, how do you, how do you end one career, look for another one? Um, especially at my age, that was a little bit difficult. I, I thought I would retire there. But looking back now, I, I see that God has a plan, God had a purpose, and those doors opened at the right time. Uh, you know, for me to be part of the reach gathering, I love event planning. I love doing things like weddings on the side. And so the reach gathering coordinator was a perfect fit for me. I, I could plan events and run events and um, the opportunities for CSRM gave me the chance still to stay in the academic world, uh, to teach with the Agone Institute and to just be a part of things. And then shortly after that, the executive director position opened to I feel like those organizational skills, the things I was doing, um, you know, just fell right into place in a, in a different opportunity. And so um, just knowing that God has a plan and a purpose, even though we don't understand it at that time, I think is just what was, you know, what was helpful for me. Just being patient, waiting and watching it unfold. But that's not easy for me. I, I like to have my things, you know, planned and um and outlined, but it was a definitely a, a time of sitting still and waiting for me. A lot of things happen very quickly, <laughs> <laughs> which tends to, to, to be the case a lot of the time. Um, would you say that 
you feel like you were more prepared to be able to take on because you you didn't just say okay now i'll just fill in here here and here you took on major roles <laughs> very quickly for two international ministries and two international networks and a publishing house and published a book and all this stuff all very very fast very very quickly do you think that you were uniquely get spiritually positioned in a way to be able to manage all of that because of the fact that you had been work, you know, kind of forced into a re re relearning of patience and spiritual patience and things like that? Or do you think that this was just, or is this something that always just has been, you know, been Vicky as far as, because I can just jump right in and take it on right off the bat. I think it's a little of both. I, I think I definitely needed time to rest and recover. I needed time to heal. That was a real, um, you know, just a real low time in my life um, because that I felt like that was my identity. Um, and looking back now, I realized that, you know, there were so many sacrifices probably that you made for, from your family, from you know, kids at that point that it wasn't necessarily the healthiest thing in the direction that that was going. And so God, uh, God saw that and, you know, op closed that door and opened another one. I've always loved the challenge. I've always um, strived to like do, do hard things. I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, you know, when a challenge rises up to me, I, I feel like that's something I want to tackle. I want to see if I'm able to do it. And so I think God wired me in that sense that, you know, some of those things didn't really scare me. They were just, oh, here's another opportunity. Let's do this and let's see where it goes. And, um, you know, like I said, just I think God knows, our, you know, obviously God knows our giftings and, and just putting those, seeing how he wove that together together. Um, you know, my, my love for event planning, my love for organization and administration. And, um, you know, just, it was just beautiful to see. Awesome. So in the midst of all of that, you wrote a book <laughs> and that book is one that we've actually been, so Greg and I both have been talking about the fact that this book is coming for a while now. Very um, long <laughs> it, we've mentioned it. For I think even back in season one, we had already mentioned the fact that this book was on its way and coming. So the book is finally available now. If you actually listen through the testimony instead of fast forwarding, you heard that Dr. Barber has had a long history of working with the disability community, both in terms of athletics and in terms of ministry and in terms of combining all three of those things together. And so she has written a book through Overwhelming Victory dealing with this topic and how, how to do it, how, how you can help, how you can get involved, all that good stuff. And so that's what we're going to spend a good amount of time talking about for the rest of our time here today. So, Dr. Byler, let's actually start with this question. Of what actually made you decide to finally write this stuff down? <laughs> Um, that's a great question. It, it was always something I wanted to do. I never uh, thought I was a writer, though. I, so I think my hesitation was in how do you get all those experiences and, and actually put them into a book? And um, the book was took a very long time to write. There was a lot of you know edits that needed to be made because we were trying to figure out what direction you know we needed to go. Um, and so I had great support from the OV you know, OV Press um, people just to help me edit and write as a new writer. But the experiences were there. And, and that part wasn't hard uh, because as I just reflected over my years of working it, with the disability uh, community, just so many stories um, being involved with Johnny and friends that just came to life in the book and just being able to see um you know, over the years, those families and how they've been impacted. And yet at times, uh, some, you know, some not being able to participate because they didn't have the opportunity. And so when we worked with the family retreats, one of my 
prayers every year. We would do several weeks of, of summer camp with the families. Um, and it was unique because the whole family came. And so then we would program for, you know, young kids, middle-aged kids, teens, adults, uh, and, and parents. So it didn't matter. Um, everybody was there together doing kind of their own little mini camp within the full camp. And um, as a rec and program team, our prayer was like, help us, Lord, help us to figure out, you know, the best way to have, you know, every person participate to the level that they wanted to. And so give me creativity, give us, uh, give us wisdom in, in how to, you know, find that line of having them participate safely, obviously, but also, um, you know, finding those activities that, you know, the people wanted to participate in. And so, uh, it was fun to to watch you know that creativity come. We would we would pack up from the the college just all the equipment that I could think of that we might be able to use, and we would drive it up to the camp, and then um, just had a great team that we you know had that creativity you know to find the ways. Working with parents, we found was probably one of the best ways because they knew their you know their family member best, and they could uh, you know help us figure out you know, what they like to do, how they wanted to participate, and then how we could do it safely. I want to start actually with the, the first part of this is to, one of the things you mentioned is that there were a lot of edits. <laughs> and I would say from my understanding of being behind the scenes for some of it, there were almost more more editing involved with this book than even some of the other ones that OV has, has put out. And there's a very good reason for that. I think that's one thing we probably should actually address first, because this is one of the things that I know keeps some churches from wanting to even deal with starting ministries that are dealing with disability or athletic ministries dealing with disability, especially, is how we actually are able to talk about it well without ruining our witness, without offending the people that we are trying to reach, without causing a bunch of new issues that were not issues beforehand <laughs> that, mm -hmm. you know, always seem to come up when you start a new ministry, but especially when you're dealing one that is much more, you know, there's insurance concerns, there's hands-on concerns, there's legal concerns, there's medical concerns, there's all sorts of things that aren't involved with other starting of ministries. Walk us through a little bit. How do what is what's your advice for somebody that's wanting to be able to try to start doing these sort of things, but is I guess scared is probably the best word for it. Scared of not being able to do it well or doing it in a way that causes more harm than good. Uh, and I agree with you. I think that that is one of the first barriers. I, I think our churches, our uh, our communities, really want to reach out and be inclusive in that way. And yet the biggest fear is we don't know how, or we don't want to offend. We don't want to do something wrong. We don't want to be on the wrong side of a, you know, legal situation. But my experience has been to gather a group of people uh, that you're trying to reach. You know, we're not trying to do a service for them. We're trying to do a service with them and through them and then also enable them to be empowered to be a part of that same ministry and continue and, and develop leadership that way. And so uh, in my experience, just you know, reaching out, talking to people, if people genuinely know you care, they're not going to be offended if you, you know, make a mistake. For example, uh, you know, someone in a wheelchair still says, can I go for a walk? It's not, can I go for a wheel? Like you don't have to be so overprotective with your language, but you do have to be very careful with your language because there is, uh, there certainly is um, language that can be used that, that is more disabling than enabling. And so the book did go through many edits. We had several people uh, impacted by disability that we said, please read, please help us make sure the language is, uh, you know, inclusive, make sure that we are using positive language um, because, you know, the, the heart is not to offend anyone, but to be inclusive. So I really feel, and we were affirmed in that, you know, that if you're really trying to break down barriers, people are going to help you do that. And so, 
again, just uh, a lot of support from the disability community, um, you know, the families that have been impacted that have read it, uh, stories that were given and being, you know, willing to be shared because they do want to see change and positive, you know, uh, positive programs in our churches. Uh, sometimes the families uh, could not get their needs met within the church. And we're not saying that every church has to meet every need and, you know, provide hundreds of programs. But as a community, we can come together and, you know, maybe one church has uh, a program where it's more um, cooperative games and activities. Another church might do something that's more competitive and just collaborating together. There's a whole chapter in the book called you know, on collaboration. How can we you know, not say my church, my church, my church, but as a community, how can we, um, you know, reach out and provide opportunities for, you know, people in our community. Another sad thing is some churches, you know, will say, uh, well, we don't have that need. There's nobody in our church that has a disability. And I would challenge that to say, maybe they're not in your church because they don't feel welcome or they don't feel like they would even belong. Um, and it's sad, there's statistics that say that the last, one of the hardest places for families to bring um, their children, uh, especially if they have behavior issues, is with inside the church because they're not, you know, they're not welcomed. And so we want to break down all of those barriers, not blaming anybody, not, you know, pointing fingers, but um, sure, there are legal battles that need, legal things that need to be considered, and there's training that needs to go on, but um, including the people that we want to reach is is the best way to do that because they've been through it their whole life, some of them, and they they have great they're a great resource. Yeah, I'd say you know the the thing with this as far as what you were just talking about, and this is part of why it was a good fit for overwhelming victory in general, is that the the stuff you're talking about there is not just exclusive to trying to do ministry to the disability community because everything you just said there is the stuff that we've been saying for every aspect of what the church is supposed to be doing i mean it's the five b's is what we're we're talking about mm -hmm. here the the belonging piece is what's missing for a lot of the ministries and churches that are not are not doing this well or doing it effectively you know even things as simple as can is your is your building ADA accessible? Is something that is a super simple thing to find out. But it's it's a, I know at least two churches that I had brought it up to them as far as well. There's no wheelchair access. That thought never crossed their minds until it had been forced to be put in their minds because the idea mm -hmm. of, well not everybody can even enter into our building was never at the was never part of the thought process it was just how can we get, get people into our building not can they mm -hmm. even enter and this this idea of belonging to the community is so central to all of it but yeah it's the hardest piece for us to ever be able to get it, which mm -hmm. is part of why it's i believe at least it's part of why it even made it into your title as far as the whole point of this is to get away from things being barriers into where we can start that discipleship process absolutely now the the other part of what you had talked about originally that i think we need to get into a little bit which is a little bit more fun to talk about is you talked about the fact that one of the things that's needed for churches to be able to do this effectively is a a willingness to get creative what are some different, some of your favorite, because you've got such an extensive history and research into this. Give us some examples of some of the more fun, creative ways that you've seen churches be able to implement these sort of ministries into their churches or into their worship services or just into just day-to-day -day activities around the building. Um. I think just finding creative people, like there's a, a local church um, near us and they they have a young adult group that is um, for specifically for people impacted by disability. And so um, they have activities, they allow the, the participants to 
you know, be involved in planning the activities, what activities would they like to do? I think one thing we also have to be careful about is just because we have uh, maybe a, a ministry group that is for intellectual um, disabilities, we can't just put them in the kids program and say, well, your intellectual level is this. And so, you know, we're going to give you little kid activities. They are, they are adults and they want to participate, you know, in adult activities. And so um, I think that is a huge, a huge area where we can, um, can be an impact, um, but allowing them to, to select the activities. Um, and this one church in particular you know, does every month they do a different, uh, you know, theme to something. And so um, they they have a large following and that church has a, has a lot of people, families impacted by disability. But the reason is they have intentionally planned and uh, put that into their budgets and into their programs. So I think the churches that do it well uh, see that as vital as any other ministry in the church and not just an add on or, you know, if someone comes and they have a disability, we'll give them a buddy. It's more than just, you know, that initial step, but you have to start somewhere. And so I think that's another fear that people have is I, I can't be church, you know, over here. How do I start that? And just, um, you know, you start by having a family and talking to that family. What does, you know, what does that family need? How can we help them? And then one family shares their experience and then there's two families and there's three families and then there's 40 families because they feel welcome. They feel like they belong and they feel like, the church is, you know, listening to their needs and helping them to meet those. One, one of the things that comes out of this that is something that, again, doesn't get talked about a lot in this part of the discussion is how do we actually do the whole, I mean, the the classroom type setting in these sort of circumstances? Because like you said, unfortunately, what happens in a lot of cases is that if you do have somebody that um, may have an intellectual disability, they just basically get thrown off in, into the kids' ministries the same way. And we've already had the discussion on here the same way we shouldn't even be doing that with the kids' ministry in general because it's a throwaway ministry a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. The disability ministry is a throwaway ministry a lot of times, so why not combine them together? But like you said, they want to be a part of the adult conversations because they are adults. How do we actually effectively have these types of settings, classrooms, whatever you want to call them within our churches that is able to both be appropriate for the development, but also at the same time be able to allow for the actual conversation that they want to have happen, happen. Because I, I, I I think one of the things that may scare some people is the idea of doing it like you were talking about is one thing, but how do you even find somebody that's capable of being the, the teacher, the leader in that kind of a setting to be able to do it appropriately that doesn't have a bunch of training and degrees or education background or special education background or whatever. How, how do we do this effectively from a leadership role not just a logistics on paper. Yeah, I would say, um, yes. I mean, education is certainly um, an important piece of that. And like we mentioned before, there are a lot of things that, you know, legally you need to be aware of. But for me, it was the heart and passion, you know, of just making sure that people were included. And so if somebody has a heart and a passion um, to do that and they surround themselves with, um, you know, others who have that heart and passion and then, you know, that education piece comes in and, and you build on that. But I think the church also has to be comfortable with um, maybe not the quietest worship service. Um, if you've ever gone into mm -hmm. uh, one of our Johnny and Friends camp worship services, um, you know, you would you would see people worshiping Jesus um, with their heart and their soul and their passion and their, their maybe not on tune when they're singing, which a lot of us aren't even when we 
<laughs> our inner, you know, inner service ourselves. But hey, shout out to the sports ministers, right? <laughs> <laughs> but their, you know, their hands are up in worship, and they're uh, they may be dancing, they may be singing, and and it's beautiful. It is beautiful, and you cannot be in that kind of worship experience and say. Uh, you know, that that person with an intellectual disability is not connecting with God. Uh, they may not understand the theology that others can, but they have a relationship with God. And, uh, you know, there there's just something sweet and innocent, uh, you know, about it and beautiful. And I was in tears many, many times sitting in our daily worship services, uh, you know, being humbled by, you know, some of the, the people that we were ministering, you know, with and to, because their, their uh, passion and heart for God put me to shame at times. Um, and yet, so we, we learn from each other. And I think that's a part of it. I know one gentleman that goes to camp, he loves to preach. And he, um, you may not understand what he's preaching, but he's preaching the word and he's preaching from his heart and his parents have worked with him. He's an, you know, an, an adult, but his parents have worked with him. His church has allowed him to do that. And then someone comes alongside of him and, you know, helps with that. But, you know, he serves and he ministers just like anybody else does in the church. And, and I think that's a piece too. We're not just ministering to them. We're allowing them to be a part of our, uh, you know, church community and giving back. And so maybe that's, you know, helping, you know, set up chairs or pew, you know, pews, being a greeter, being, uh, you know, whatever capacity, working in children's ministry uh, with others, you know, to be, to see that whole full circle where they're not just being ministered to, but now they are ministering and, and giving back. To me, that's where the whole belonging, you know, piece comes all the way around. Yeah, I think it, it again, part of the, Part of the reason why this discussion doesn't happen, which I think is actually a bigger barrier than even some of the barriers that happen when the discussions start, is that the discussion doesn't happen because of, like we said before, the fear, the anxiety of all of it. But the, I think this is another example of where we really are, in many ways, showing the fact that we don't fully recognize the work that the spirit is able to do within the body when we just let it work. Mm -hmm. Because if we actually do believe that, then these ideas of, well, what are they going to do in the service go away? The noise level concerns are gone and we just let the spirit do what he's going to do. It changes again, changes the perspective the same way when we had the mental health discussion with, with Joel We've had it with multiple other other guests as well in terms of that when we actually start talking about worship services, I think one of the biggest barriers in general, not just to this discussion, but in general, is the fact that we don't actually talk about it in a way that is worshipful. We just talk about it, just the logistics on paper and what's going to look good on the camera. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Byler, let's go one step further then for churches that have been doing this, that have been having ministries that have been working with the disabled community and they are discovering now that perhaps they may not have actually been doing it well. They may have been doing it in a way that may have even been harmful at times. What what advice do you have for, for them in terms of being able to make the corrections now in a way that is effective and not just, oh, well, we just have to make the changes to make the changes? Like I said, uh, uh, apologies go a long way. Um, if you feel that you've you know offended a family or you've you know done something that, uh, you know, hindsight says you shouldn't have, I think just going to that person, you know, or that family and saying, you know, just admitting, they know you're not doing it right, obviously, because <laughs> it's not working, but, um, and including them to be a part of that process, but including them because you want them to be a part, not including them because, 
uh, you need someone to run that ministry. So let me give you an example. A lot of families say that, you know, when they do come into a church, then they're asked to run the ministry because they've got the experience um, or they're the ones asked to coach because they're the ones that know how to best manage, you know, that particular child. And so that's not fair to the parent. That parent never gets to be a parent to sit in the stands and observe and to watch their child participate um, because they're always having to be, you know, that coach, the leader as well. And but those parents, those families are great resources to come alongside and help us learn how to have their child participate. Um, I know one of the things that are, is happening often in the schools now when a child is in a classroom setting that might uh, be impacted by a disability, having that parent and that child come in and talk about that disability. So especially younger students can realize I'm not going to catch that. I'm not going to catch something from them. I'm not going to hurt them if I participate. Um, and they, if they understand what the disability is, how to best include that person um, and that person and their family is a part of the conversation, I think that goes a long way. One of the things I feel really blessed with my kids growing up was they, they came with me to camp. And so our oldest son in particular um, really had a heart and passion for the, you know, the child who had a disability in school and reached out to those that were included because that's what he grew up seeing. Um, there was, there were no differences when you were, you know, at camp. And so that was a blessing, you know, just from me being involved as a, as a parent, but, um, you know, we, we, have to not be afraid to enter a difficult conversation to say, tell me about your disability. Um, every year when we would do camp, we would get a list of the you know families that were coming and the disabilities that they had. And, and I would be like, wow, I don't, I don't know about this disability, but let me learn about it. Let me, you know, read about it. Let me understand. And then having a conversation with the family, what, you know, what is your child able to do? How can we best help them, um, you know, and, and make things work for them um, based on that. And families appreciate that more than just being ignored or, or saying, I don't want to have that difficult conversation. Even when it comes with behaviors, I learned a lesson as a, as a teacher, we would bring students in and they would work with our adapted uh, PE class and we would give them, you know, have a reward system for different, you know, things that we were trying to get them to participate in fitness or exercise and this one particular girl would not participate. And no matter what token, you know, prize, candy, whatever we would, you know, we were trying to give. And so I had a conversation with her mom um, after that. And she just laughed and she said, bring a jar of pickles. And this story is in the book, too. And I thought, pickles, that's an odd reward. But her daughter loved pickles. And so next week when or the next time we had them, uh, you know, come to the gym, uh, we had a jar of pickles and she suddenly participated because that was the the reward that was meaningful to her. And so uh, that has just stayed in my mind forever. Pickles, uh, you know, as just something because you had a conversation with someone and said what works, what motivates your, you know, your child to to want to participate. And so that to me stuck with me just because without that conversation, we would have never, you know, made, made progress, uh, you know, in that setting. Um, and so I would just say, don't hesitate to have a conversation with people to ask questions because if they really believe you care and you really want to help, they will do anything, you know, in their power to help you help their family. So with that, there's a couple of, uh, Yes, heavier questions I want to ask before we we close out here. And the first one is one that you've kind of answered, but I want to actually make sure we ask it directly and answer it directly. Is if what what advice would you give to a family of someone that either they themselves are disabled or they have somebody in their family that is? that has been harmed by the church doing this wrong or just not doing it at all. What advice do you give them in terms of how they can move forward, whether back to the church or just healing in general 
what what advice would you give them? Uh, I worked with a, a, a coworker named Mike, and he um, he's mentioned also in the book. Um, and he is a wheelchair user now, based uh, because of a motorcycle accident that he was involved in as a teen. And he you know, he would tell stories, even as strong as his faith is. There are times when his faith is is you know tested there because. Someone will walk up and say, well, if you just prayed more, you would be healed. Or if you just believed more, uh -huh. you know, then you would be healed. And, you know, just just some different harmful things that people say over time um, that challenge us. And, you know, just going back to the fact that, you know, God has a plan and a purpose for everything. We don't understand it. Um, and and yet if we just trust in that and we are supportive of that and we find a church community where we can belong and that church community sees our gifts and abilities and, and supports those gifts and abilities. Um, you know, that's where we have community. That's where we belong. And so if they have been hurt by the church or been hurt by, you know, an organization, I would just encourage them to find, you know, a, a different church, a different organization that is going to be welcoming and inviting and, you know, to, to just, um, or even go back to that church and say, this is, you know, we've been harmed, uh, be a voice, be an advocate. Uh, you know, the verse that just talks about being an advocate for those that can't speak for themselves. Like we need to rise up and be that voice in our churches and in our communities um, to make that change. So do you have any, I don't know if there's any databases, anything like that, or maybe this is something for um, us to work on within, within CSRM and OV. Any places that you know of that you can go to find, you know, a database or a list of churches, organizations that are actually doing this well within it, within a regional area or geographic location? Are there any places that that you know of to do that? Or do you have any tips on on how to find churches that are actually doing this well within your area? Uh, that's funny. We, we talked about you know, trying to to do a resource list in the book. Um, and at that point we were going, you know, to publishing. But um, so I I would just say to to just start searching um, for disability ministry um, in, you know, on a website and find what churches are doing it well there. It, there is no database that I'm aware of, but there are a lot of you know, organizations that work with disability ministries. And we've mentioned a few here, just, you know, Johnny and friends or reach out, reach out to me um, at, you know, and I will try to help, you know, point them in that direction. But there are a lot of churches doing it well. Uh, some of the research that I did for the book led me to, you know, other people to have conversations um, you know, because we found that those, you know, we found a church that was doing it well. And so, um, it is a little bit of, you know, work to do, but there are churches doing it and those churches can help reach out, you know, to other churches. So Johnny and Friends is another great resource. Uh, people can reach out and find, you know, where the local Johnny and Friends office is because they are doing disability ministry in, you know, a variety of communities around the world. Yeah. Another one that we are um, all connected with through the CSRM work that's doing a lot of this stuff is Ability Ministry with Ryan Wolf. They also are one that probably mm -hmm. have some information, if not, not, maybe not a ton, but they probably can at least help direct you in the right direction. Um, and, and their information will be up here soon as well. But the, the last question I've got for you, and this one may be a little bit heavier than even the rest is one though that I think we need to address before we close out. What do you say to the churches that want to claim that doing these types of things, having these kind of conversations is just woke nonsense that's capitulating to the world? How, how do we go about addressing these things well, being an advocate, being a voice for the voiceless, when we have... Theolo theological voices claiming that to do so is is denying the faith 
Uh, one of the hardest chapters that we have in the book was the chapter on theology. I mean, that was written and rewritten and rewritten um, because if you do a study on the theology of disability, it, it opens this door wider than I could ever have imagined. Because from my perspective, it's, you know, the evangelical theological, you know, discussion there. But um, I had an incredible eye-opening experience just you know going through that those chapters and and doing some of the research um, so we do have to be careful there but finding you know finding those resources of organizations that are doing disability ministry well and and having that sound theology I mean, we're called to go out into all the world to, to preach the gospel and to uh, you know, make disciples of Jesus. And the disability community is one of those communities that um, has been left out of that conversation. And um, they're not, they don't have a seat at the table to even, you know, have that conversation. And so uh, for me, I just feel like um, that's, a, a, you know, a population of people that need to have a voice spoken for them. And we need to be advocates for that. Um, I, I don't think it's, you know, a woke thing. I think it's it's a, a population of our communities that's being left out of uh, a lot of things, left out of fitness, recreation, left out of the, the church. And um, we are called to go into that community. Yeah. So her book, From Barriers to Belonging, it is finally out. Um, where where can we find it at the moment? Because I know where it's it's newly published. It's not available quite everywhere yet. But where can we find it for the time being? That's a great question, Andrew. I'm not sure where it is. So we're gonna have to talk to Greg about uh, about that one. I know they did. I, it okay, so we're gonna have to call our EP. <laughs> so. Yeah. Once we find out, once Dr. Lindell gives us an answer, we will let you know. There will be a link available in her guest portal on our website. Um, I believe it probably will be available in the CSRM store here soon. Uh, most of our stuff also ends up on Amazon eventually as well, so you'll be able to find it. Um, but uh, you're, this isn't the only thing you're doing. Like we said, you're very busy now. So What's going on with CSRM? We haven't had an update in a while. What Anything interesting new happening over with CSRM? Um, we are connecting uh, with our internationals right now. There's a ton of stuff going on around the world uh, with the internationals. Uh, just incredible stuff that we're hearing and seeing in monthly reports. So check out the newsletters or check out the website for some of those updates. Uh, we are hosting REACH in Ohio, which is where CSRM was originally based. So we have a goal to try to get as many of our internationals uh, to REACH. And so we're going to be working. I'm writing, busy writing letters of, uh, of invitation for them so they can get their visas. Uh, so uh, some just behind the scenes stuff that has to be done for every organization. We just redid everybody's job descriptions and have those updated in files, a lot of administrative things. Let's see, our next big projects, we're trying to work to the to approve a bridge to the fu uh, Future Foundation. Uh, we have meetings about mm -hmm. that this week, just a, a new way to for donors to give, not only to the current budget year, but also to you know future years. So fundraising, um, Watching a lot of podcasts on fundraising, that's an area that I feel like we need to still continue to do because every organization needs to be funded. Um, so those are some of the exciting things that are happening. We have the Agone Institute going on. Um, we took a break for the month of July, but we've had classes going almost you know, around the clock to do that every six weeks. Um, also looking at several partnerships. We have a, a partnership with uh, the Caribbean Nazarene University, trying to get a program, you know, off the ground for them. Also having conversations with several other countries uh, where we would partner to have uh, the Agone Institute or something similar be a part of their seminary. So a lot of things in the work behind the scenes, um, still trying to figure out some of those partnerships and when they would launch. Awesome. So yeah, if you want all that information, csrm.org. Um, you can subscribe to the newsletter there. You can also get it through all the social media channels. Um, most Misfit channels also will connect you to the CSRM stuff as well. 
um, when that stuff kind of comes out. If you're interested in what she was talking about happening in Columbus next next spring, um, that's Reach Gathering. Reach Gathering is a annual networking for sports rec and fitness ministers internationally. Um, next year, it's happening in Columbus. Um, Dr. Byler is one of the main leaders for that there as well because, you know, she can't be busy enough. And so you can find out more information about that at reachgathering.org. Um, and you can check out all the different people that are there, all the foundational partners like CSRM and Seed Network and things like that. And you'll be able to meet them there and all that good stuff. Um, normally, you guys also do a panel related to our conversation today. I don't know if that's in the works for next year or not, but a lot of good stuff. Uh, between Greg and Vicky and David Waddell and Bob Schindler and all sorts of other experts in the field, there's always good stuff going on there with Reach Gathering. So in the meantime, though, again, if you want to check out all the other things that Vicky is doing, um, you can get, get her guest portal um, over on the Misfits site, ministrymisfits.com. Go to the resources tab, go to the guest tab, and then find her. Uh, she should be towards the top because it's alphabetical. Um <laughs> She should be there towards the top. Um, you'll find links to CSRM, Reach Gathering, Overwhelming Victory. Um, once we figure out where Greg hit her book, we'll also put links up there. Um, in the meantime, also, if you want to support Misfits, you can do so. Patreon.com backslash Mystery Misfits. We are going to finish. I know we keep saying it. We are going to finish the Daniel Bible study eventually. Hopefully, Tamiko and I's schedules are finally going to smooth out to where we can finish. Um, but you can get all of that good stuff as well as early access to episodes and blogs and things like that over at patreon.com backslash mystery misfits. So Dr. Byler, thank you for finally, uh, finally slowing down enough for me to catch up with you to, to get you on here. Um, we are also very thankful for the work you're doing both with CSRM and OV, as well as just doing the theology of the disability and things like that, that you've been working on for a long time. And so we will see the rest of you all next week. The Ministry Misfits podcast is a production of Ministry Misfit Media in association with Overwhelming Victory. Dr. Greg Linville and Andrew Fouts are our executive producers and Brandon Simmons is associate producer. The Ministry Misfits theme song is written and produced by J.D. Laird and Laird Creative Agency. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at ministrymisfitmedia at gmail.com or by following at Ministry Misfit on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also visit our website at www.ministrymisfits.com or through bio.link backslash Ministry Misfits. If you would like to support Ministry Misfits, you can become a patron by going to patreon.com backslash Ministry Misfits. 